This video is brought to you by Smarter MA. Get instant access to a completely free NHA CCMA practice test with detailed explanations at smarterma.com. Here we go. First question. Which of the following actions should a medical assistant take when preparing a patient for Holter monitoring? So real quick as a review, what is Holter monitoring? So a Holter monitor looks like this. It's a little device that is worn around the neck with a bunch of electrodes fashioned onto the chest. And with a Holter monitor, it's going to record the heart rhythms continuously over a period of 24 to 48 hours. So the patient's gonna have it applied at the medical office, go home, continue to wear it over a period of 24 to 48 hours, typically 24, and they're gonna continue normal activities during monitoring. So they're not going to change too much, although most importantly, they need to avoid showering because they don't want to get the monitors wet. They then come back to the medical office and this device is then analyzed. And what the provider is looking for is abnormal electrical rhythms. So things like arrhythmias or abnormal patterns. And what's really helpful about this is that it's a non-invasive test. So what that means is that it doesn't really require a lot from the patient. They just have to wear this Holter monitor. Otherwise, it's pretty easy. Now going back to our question, a medical assistant who's preparing a patient for Holter monitoring must do which of the following. They are going to dry and abrade the patient's skin at the site of electrode placement. What's this mean? So basically the assistant is going to take a dry gauze and lightly rub the area where the electrode is going to be placed. This is going to help to make sure that any oils that are in that area are removed. And abrade just means to rough it. It's almost like scratching up the skin surface on a very micro way, which is going to help that electrode to stick in place and ensure that it's going to stay in place over the duration of the patient wearing it. Now looking at the other answer choices, why are they incorrect? A clean the skin with iodine. Iodine is a disinfectant. It's often used as a surgical disinfectant, but the electrode application doesn't require disinfection for Holter monitoring. Furthermore, the iodine actually might interfere with the adhesion. Next, adjust the treadmill to a 15 degree angle. So during a cardiac stress test, a patient has a series of electrodes put on them, and then they do some sort of physical exertion on a treadmill. Often during a cardiac stress test, we might increase the angle of the treadmill to make the patient actually start to work, their heart start to pump. And so we're not going to be adjusting in any treadmill because a treadmill isn't used in Holter monitoring. That's used within a cardiac stress test, where again, a Holter monitor is actually worn at home over a period of 24 to 48 hours. It's not a test that's done in the office. And then finally, trim any hair in the area. No, if there is hair in the area of the electrode placement, this hair actually should be shaved, not trimmed. So if we notice that the patient has a hairy chest and you're trying to place an electrode on there, we need to make sure the electrode has good contact with the skin that it can conduct electricity between the electrode and the skin surface. And so if we do see hair, we need to make sure that we're shaving that hair to prepare a patient for electrode placement, not trimming it. That's a subtle difference here because it says trim, but that's what makes this answer incorrect. Next question. A medical assistant is studying infectious diseases and their causative agents. Which of the fine microorganisms is responsible for the onset of chickenpox? So yes, this is a high yield concept that comes up on medical assistant certification tests. Do you know the microorganism that causes X condition? And there's a couple that come up pretty regularly, one of them being chicken pox. And the answer to this question is B, varicella zoster virus, also known as VSV. So there's no silver bullet here. You just got to memorize it. That varicella zoster virus is the cause of chicken pox. And another high yield condition that's also caused by varicella zoster virus is shingles. Shingles being a painful rash that kind of looks like this, which is actually caused by a reactivation of the varicella zoster virus. So a person gets chicken pox typically as an infant or a young child. And then if that virus reactivates later on in life, it can lead to this really painful rash that's known as shingles, both caused by VSV, both chicken pox and shingles. Look at the other answer choices, treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum is a high yield bacteria that is responsible for syphilis. So this is saying that they love to ask about syphilis. What's the cause? Remember, treponema pallidum. And I've said this before in other rapid review videos, that's how commonly this comes up. Streptococcus pyogens, I wouldn't worry too much about this one, but basically you can remember that strep is often the cause of strep throat, right? That makes sense. That's what that strep within strep throat is referring to strep as in streptococcus. And it's also a cause of impetigo. Impetigo being the skin scab condition that's very contagious. And then finally, E. coli. E. coli is most commonly known as a cause of food poisoning. So for example, chicken gets left out too long that can lead to E. coli developing within the chicken. People consume it, leads to food poisoning, which is a very nasty condition that typically resolves within one day that involves a lot of vomiting. Next question, which of the following characteristics can help identify psoriasis? So first, 
what is psoriasis? Psoriasis is a chronic skin condition. Chronic means that it's long lasting. It doesn't just go away, right? Acute is kind of short lived, whereas chronic is long lasting. And it's a skin condition where the cells multiply too quickly and it leads to red scaly patches on the skin. So this is a classic presentation of psoriasis. These red scales that kind of show up, you can see the scaliness and the redness showing up all over the body on the skin. And, and it is of note that it's an autoimmune disorder. So that's the body's own immune system causing this response. And it can lead to a lot of itching and discomfort and can appear anywhere on the body. So going back to our answer choice, what are we looking for with psoriasis? It's that red and scaly skin. And for this next question, we're gonna head to smarterma.com, the number one most powerful resource for students preparing for their NHAC CMA. Head to smarterma.com right now to get started with a completely free practice test, no credit card required. So let's look at this practice test question from Smarter MA. A medical medical assistant is administering an intramuscular injection. Which of the following needle sizes should the assistant use? So in order to answer this question, we need to figure out what needle size is needed for an intramuscular injection. That's an injection that goes into the muscle. And this isn't an easy question. It's one that you have to have the knowledge in your head. And if you don't know things like this, I'd recommend heading to smarterma.com right now, where we cover everything that you need to know for your medical assistant certification test. But the answer to this question for an intramuscular injection is a half to two inch needle that is 21 gauge. And for for an intramuscular injection, we're gonna give it at a 90 degree angle. We're gonna use a half to two inch needle. This is the length of the needle and it needs to be 18 to 21 gauge, which represents the width of the needle. And really important to remember here, the higher the gauge of the needle, the thinner it is. So for example, a 30 gauge needle is actually much thinner than a 20 gauge needle. So high gauge needle equals thin needle. Therefore, low gauge needle equals thick needle. For intramuscular, we're using an 18 to 21 gauge needle. That's pretty low. Therefore, Therefore, this is a fairly thick needle. And again, there's no secret sauce here. This is just about memorization. And we have all types of content like this at SmarterMA. And there's a lot of different numbers that you'll see thrown out there on the internet. We base all of our numbers on what the test makers actually officially release, what the reference ranges are. So you'll need to study and memorize this list in order to be prepared for your test. And we have plenty of questions just like this on SmarterMA that you can check out to practice with. Next question. A medical assistant is performing a venipuncture for a blood draw. According to standard guidelines, at what point should the tourniquet be removed? And again, this is just one that you have to know from exposure. The answer to this question is, what you've watched so far is only a preview of the lesson. If you want to unlock the rest of the video, as well as get access to a completely free NHA CCMA practice test, you've got to check out SmarterMA.com. SmarterMA is the number one most trusted resource for students preparing for their CCMA certification test. So what are you waiting for? Stop struggling, start learning. You can get started with a completely free practice test at SmarterMA.com. I'll see you there.